Hello everybody, I hope you're all well and welcome back to episode 8 of the John Teresa podcast. I should really actually start keeping track of this properly but welcome back. Again, for anyone that's listening on Spotify, I do have visuals if you want to go over to YouTube and watch. Every episode from now on will have visuals. I've decided it for myself because the response from my last episode was so nice. Thank you guys so, so much for all of the love on the last episode. Um, If you are watching watching slash listening on YouTube, make sure you give it a thumbs up, leave a little comment on your thoughts of whatever we're talking about today. Um, and if you are listening on Spotify or Apple, uh, make sure you give it a rating because it means a lot. And um, today's episode is a little bit more of just sort of a multi-topic random one really because personally my favorite podcasts to listen to are ones which are just like eclectic where they're talking about random things and even though I had a lot of fun filming my last one recording my last one rather and filming my last one now ah excited visuals now ah sorry sorry if I just burst anyone's eardrums um but oh god I've lost my train of thought already see god the struggles of podcasting am I right or am I right sorry Boots is chewing Boots is in the room with me right now and she is chewing on a wire. And now she's trying to chew on my foot. Um, I was actually getting so annoyed editing because because I film it in like my bedroom, I keep hearing sort of like background noise, chair creaking, clicking, things like that. Um, which is just like, these are noises which are impossible to get rid of unless you record in a studio. So I need to be nicer to myself. But anyways, as much fun as I did recording, I, I, I did have recording the last episode. If you haven't checked it out, I judge Love Island as brand deal. So go check it out if you haven't already. Um, I don't know, maybe it's just a me thing, but I felt like the energy was sort of teetering off towards the end because already recording an, a podcast on your own, um, of course, there's like lots of benefits on the fact that you don't have to like gather whoever your friends are to record it. Like, I don't know about you, but like being an adult, I see my friends like once a month. <laughs> like I see my closest, so I see my friend Jake at least once a week. Like we definitely see each other once a week, me and Jake. And then sort of Jake, Adam, Eleanor, them all together, I probably see them every other week. And then me and Lem's friends, I probably see them every other week as well. And then my actual like friends from school, I see them once a month maximum maximum I think I'm seeing Lily twice this month which is like actually quite insane for us I think I went through one phase where I didn't see them for like four months but that's just what being an adult is like but yeah no so there's like lots of benefits to filming on your own and the fact that I can literally just do it whenever I want like I can do it today and I'm home alone and that's great but also like it can be quite difficult to keep up the energy when you're by yourself I remember once oh my gosh who did I say this to I can't remember who I said it to, but I said it to one of mine and Lem's friends. I was like, yeah, like I'm starting a podcast. And they were like, oh really, who with? And I was like, I'm doing it on my own. And he was like, what? <laughs> I was like, honestly, same. Like I get it. Like people don't really get, po- people, who, people who don't really like, who don't really like get people doing podcasts on their own. Like I totally understand because it's, because it's difficult. And I felt the energy sort of teetering off. And I think maybe the energy sort of was lacking a bit towards the end, sorry. I look, I keep thinking I look sweaty, but actually I look really glowy. Sorry, I literally just did my makeup. Um, Oh, did you hear that? Sorry, Boots is playing down here and I'm expecting Lem to get home from work soon because he works in a school. It's not funny, I've got skill. Yeah, no, so it can be quite difficult to keep up the energy when you're by yourself, but because I've got sort of multiple topics, I feel like I'll be able to keep up the energy a little bit better. Obviously, naturally, the energy is going to teeter off because I get tired. Like, guys, podcasting is actually really hard. <laughs> but no, like, you, you you start to get tired literally just from talking to yourself. One second. I need to know if anyone is as a big of a Ribena stan as I am. I think I drink one bottle at least of Ribena a day. I know that's so bad for you, but I don't care. I only live once, bitch. Like, come on. This is so good. Like, this stuff is so good. Um, So today in the Jordan Trees podcast, a little teaser as to what we're talking about today. 
I am going to be obviously starting it off with a TV show I'm watching, book I'm reading and song I'm listening to. I used to do that like a couple, um, it says, um, it's just like six months ago, but it's literally just a couple of episodes because I used to be so inconsistent with this podcast. Um, I'm going to be doing TV show I'm watching, book I'm reading, song I'm listening to. Um, and then I'm going to be talking about Matt Hancock and I'm a Celebrity, uh, Billie Eilish and her new boyfriend, and also the Jack Wills rebrand and a few other things in between, obviously, because as we know, I teeter off into the abyss. Um, but obviously, thank you so much for all the love. But I was wondering, sorry, a little bit random. I want to know, again, I feel like I'm getting really ahead of myself, but I have like truly gotten into the podcast thing. Like, this is fun. Like, I, look, I do genuinely love making YouTube videos, but like, it's not something which I wake up and like look forward to doing. Like I know it sounds really bad, but I've already said in my last episode, I don't enjoy recording videos because they're so scripted. It's like just very stressful. And I know it's not like actually stressful compared to like an actual like proper retail job. Like I was way st- more stressed in Starbucks than I was recording a video, but just the script thing, it just stresses me out. Okay. Um, so I don't really regret it. And then sort of researching, it really depends what I'm doing, but you just have to use brain power and it's like quite a lot of effort. But like with podcasting, I just get to sort of do a little research of what I want to talk about today and then just talk about it with you guys. And I really enjoy it. <laughs> like I was really looking forward to it. Like the, sorry, I'm going to talk about this later, but you know, basically what, what I was starting with this conversation was I was wondering anyone who is a fan of the podcast, would you be interested in me setting up a Patreon? I don't really know like what I would do. But like, I would definitely do bonus episode and I would definitely do early access and maybe like a shout out or something. Like, I don't really know. I had a Patreon before a couple years ago on YouTube and ended up basically shutting it because I basically just used it so I could afford to put closed closed captions on. Um, But yeah, I was wondering if you guys would be interested in because I've only actually, weirdly enough, I've only just applied, been uh, available, been able to do put to put monetization on the youtube format of the podcast so other than that this podcast is a labor of love um so yeah let me know if you guys would ever want to support it feel free to dm me on instagram or leave a comment in the youtube comments um yeah so let's actually get into the episode today so to get the ball rolling i thought i'd talk about tv show i'm watching uh song i'm listening to and a book i'm reading so the tv shows i'm watching uh, well, actually, right now I am binge watching Love is Blind for my next YouTube video. So I'm not gonna talk about it too much because I don't want any spoilers. But like I've said this in my last episode, having to binge watch a reality show makes me want to die. Like it's it's not stimulating. Like it's not stimulating. I only really enjoy watching reality shows when I'm with someone else, like when I'm with someone else, when I'm with Lem, because me and Lem, like, we we have a giggle. We have a little giggle, you know, we have a little riff, you know, like we have like loads of fun watching the stuff and, you know, we can bounce off each other, we make lots of jokes. When you watch it on your own, it just feels like quite quiet and it makes you feel like a bit of a shell of a person. Um, So I've been binge watching Love is Blind right now for my next video, but I'm not going to talk about that. I've also been watching Game of Thrones. Lem forced me to watch Game of Thrones as in like took my phone off of me and said, we need to sit down and watch this. And if you don't like it after the first few episodes, we can drop it. But I actually really enjoyed it. And now we're on season seven. Oh my God, guys. The Battle of the Bastards. That went crazy. The last episodes of season six also went crazy. I, I'm i not going to talk about it too much because I know a lot of people haven't watched Game of Thrones. But I used to be someone that was like, I'm never going to watch Game of Thrones. It looks boring. Da, da, da. I will eat my fucking words. I will eat my fucking words. It's such a good show. Um, And then the next show I've been watching, me and Lem have been watching it for the past few days. Doctor Who. Oh, guys, I am not sure whether I've ever shared this information willingly about myself because I used to be a bit embarrassed about this part of my life. But now that I'm like an adult, I truly don't do not give a fuck. I used to be the biggest Doctor Who fan. Like, I am not even joking. I so I stopped watching it when David Tennant left because obviously David Tennant was my favorite. David Tennant's on my Dilf list. I have a Dilf list on my phone if you don't know. And David Tennant is near to the top. It's like, <laughs> you know, that TikTok style that's like, something's happening inside me and I don't know why. That was me watching David Tennant as the doctor for the first time when I was like 10 years old. Um, yeah, and no, I was actually, I used to watch it every single week. I had all of the action figures. I had a TARDIS like action um, figure 
like inside my wardrobe, like the actual inside of the TARDIS. Um, I had a canine dog. I had a subscription to the monthly magazine. I had a canine, did I say just say a canine dog? Did I just say that? See, this is the problem with doing a podcast. You just forget what, what you're saying. Basically, I had top trumps, I had books, I had the Doctor Who books. Like, oh, I was a huge, huge fan. So we're rewatching it and I, guys, I can't even lie. It's so good. Like, <laughs> like it's so good. Like, it, that is so fucking slaps. And David Tennant's so good looking. Oh my God. And Billy Piper's gorge as well. Um, yeah, no, so that's what we've been rewatching right now. And it's just as good as I remember it being. Lem was like laughing and uh, laughing about it at first. Like we were watching, I think it was the episode with the, with the, uh, with the Slitheen and they were like unzipping their foreheads and Lem was like, this is absolutely fucking ridiculous. And now we're on to the 10th Doctor and Lem is like so invested, like he absolutely loves it. Um, the song I'm listening to, I've just been listening to 212 Azealia Banks on repeat. I think that came out like 11 years ago, which I actually can't believe, but what an incredible song. I like that song from the day that it came out. I remember really, really liking it. And I remember, sorry, this memory has just, popped into my head I remember my dad and it was one of his girlfriends they it came on in the car or like someone had it or someone was like bluetoothing in the car or like orcs in the car and that song came on and his girlfriend made us turn it off because like there were too many swear words in it like what a way to fucking kill the vibe very what oh sorry i'm getting annoyed just thinking about it um and then the book i am reading is i actually have it right here so i can show you guys uh it is the it is the death of expertise the campaign against established knowledge and why it matters by tom nichols so this actually so i saw this on tiktok which is why i bought it and this is actually was written before the trump election before brexit and before covid um and it's really really interesting basically a lot of you guys have been asking me to talk about anti-intellectualism and i don't know anything about it so i bought a book um i'm not that far into it at all like i'm literally i'm literally like a chapter in if that like I'm not that far into it at all but basically it's about just people not trusting experts anymore and especially with like the rise of the internet people think that they're just as smart as experts and they don't need experts and obviously like some expertise should be like questioned which I'm sure he's going to address in this book like things with you know problems with the NHS like misogyny in the NHS racism in the NHS transphobia in the NHS like in that in that sense we should be questioning experts um which i'm sure he will probably get into in this book but it's mostly i feel like a lot of it relates to like you know people that were refusing to get vaccinated because they thought they knew more about doctors or something which which is really uh sort of a symptom of anti-intellectualism i hope i'm using these words right this sentence feels way too intelligent to be coming out of my mouth is again the covid pandemic conspiracy theories anti-vaxxers and especially the treatment of chris witty in this country um if you aren't from the uk chris witty was like a, a health expert like a health expert and he was basically sort of the person who was a health advisor like, I don't, sorry i haven't really researched for this bit but basically he gave the government advice on what to do during a pandemic because he was a health expert and this man got like terrorized like i feel so bad for him i cannot even imagine how drastically different his life is now um like there was one these two men got arrested because they were like harassing him on the street and throwing things at him and like saying that he was a liar and that he made it all up and he was a cons like it was like this larger grand conspiracy um which it, and, and to be honest chris witty was literally just a man who was trying to help like that was it. I felt so bad for him. I don't think he's a Tory. I don't think he's like politically affiliated with anyone. I think, I hope he's not a Tory, but no, like I don't think he's politically affiliated with anyone. He's literally just a health expert and he got fucking treated and like shit by conspiracy theorists and anti-vaxxers and it was really awful. And basically, you know, this book is about people going against experts um, and I can't wait to, re can't wait to probably read it and I'll let you guys know what I think. Um... Sorry, let me put that down. So, something really weird is happening to me. <laughs> something, something strange is out to me and I don't know why. Um, I need to know if any other people with uh, like vaginas or people, you know, with, I don't know, uteruses 
like feel this way or just people in general actually sorry um I've been having the most insane baby fever and I don't know what's going on. So if you don't know this about me, I have been pretty set on not having children for the past like few years. Um, It's just never been something that interests me. I don't really like kids. Um, I don't really like sort of the, I guess like sort of like the hustle and bustle that comes with having children. Like... One second, sorry. Is my boyfriend texting me? Like, this sounds really stupid, but (laughs) I don't like children related activities. Like the thought of going to a resort with a bunch of kids. When I had to go to my, as much as I love my little sister, I had to go to her birthday party and it was not enjoyable. Having to sort of kiki with other parents when like you wouldn't be friends with them in any other context other than the fact that your parents by the way, I'm waiting for Lem to come home from work. Can you hear him? I think he's coming in. Hello. Sorry. No, it's okay. He, sorry. I, was... I can hear you singing in the hallway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, this is actually perfect timing that you're here, Lem. I've been having the most insane baby fever and you I... Want me to give you a baby right now. I do. I literally do. Like, I was thinking about the fact that I want a baby so badly still. To be fair, it's worn off a little bit because I was like, I forgot that babies turn into children. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like, I won't just have, like, a cute little baby. I I think children are better. You think children are better than babies? Yeah. I think I prefer a baby. Well, the kids at school. The kids at school. School? Yeah, they... Do me little drawings and make me hats and paper airplanes and stuff. Do. Yeah, that's true actually. If you don't know, Lem's a teaching assistant at a primary school. Um, but also like, to be fair, and then again, I was also thinking, well, with babies, you are rel- you, they are reliant on you for everything. Like they can't even bloody wipe their own ass. They can't yeah. even feed or drink or, or feed them or thirst themselves. Thirst themselves. Drink yeah. themselves. Quench their own. Thirst. Quench their own thirst. Like they can't do anything. So they're completely reliant on you in that in that aspect. But then also like, and then also with children, you can sort of dump them in school for what is it, seven hours a day? Yeah. And we could send the child to your school. Oh, so you can so you can take it to school every day and I can yeah. stay in bed. I'm telling you, this is a good idea. I want a baby. Sorry about that, guys. Lem came home from work. Um. Anyway, so I was back onto my baby fever thing. So I've always been very like, I don't want children because I just don't really, it's not like I dis, to be fair, I don't like a lot of children because they're annoying. <laughs> but like, also I don't really like a lot of children adjacent activities, Um. like having to, you know, socialize with a bunch of parents and like a bunch of kids. Like, oh my gosh, when I, me and my mom went to Ikea and we had to go during the half term. And by the way, I'm not one of those people that's like, something which is like an ick of mine is people that like really, really hate children. Like, you know, people that complain about like crying babies on flights. Like what, were you never a baby before? Like, shut up. Like that stuff is cringy. Like I'm not one of the people that like absolutely hates children and will make it my entire personality trait that like, I don't want kids. But I used to be really, really certain on not wanting kids because I just didn't think I wanted that for my life. You know, like I just want, I wanted to, I wanted to live a life of leisure. But recently, I don't know what's happened. I really want a baby. <laughs> and it's teetering off a little bit now because I realized that babies turn into children and children can be quite annoying. But also like when your child when your baby becomes a child, you can send them to school for eight hours a day. And because Lem works in a school, my I could send my child to Lem's school and he could take her there and I don't have to do any of the picking up or dropping off. It's just so ideal. But um, I've been thinking a lot about my baby fever and like why I've been getting baby fever recently. And I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that like, I am viewing at the moment, I, to be fair, I've always found labor and birth and pregnancy super, super interesting. Um, but I think like, this sounds so stupid, but I feel like I'm viewing motherhood in a very different context recently, like a context which is more relatable to me and my life. So a lot of the time on social media, 
I sort of only really see motherhood in like a, you know, someone who has four children, like literally four children, four entire children, like, oh my God, <laughs> like four really young children and their life seems really stressful. And of course, women who like have four kids um, or just people that have four kids in general, like usually, even though it's a bloody hard work, like it's a bloody hard job, they clearly enjoy it. Like that's why they keep on having children. Like it's worth all the work. Like they say it's the most rewarding job in the world. That just does not seem ideal to me at all. Or like having to move in like out of the city or having to sort of move away from you where away from where you've lived for a really long time to be either closer to your parents, um, just somewhere which is closer to schools. Um you know, you know, stuff like that, like petty stuff like that, of like having to sort of really uproot your life a bit because you have a child and you want to do what's best for the child. And either they're like a little bit older, like 30, and they start having children and they pop out like four kids within like seven years, which is just like so insane to me. Like I, I look up to people who do that. I look up to people who do that so, so much because it genuinely, raising children is the hardest job in the world. You can't tell me any different. Raising a child is the hardest, hardest job in the world. Um, and again, I don't want it to start with kind of cause like, oh my God, like I'm a, like, I'm gonna be a pick me mom. Like I'm not like the other moms. Like, no, I don't No, I'm giving myself the ick. I don't want it to come across as that, but I think recently I've been seeing motherhood in a context which I find more relatable to my life as in like, sort of young-ish adults, like women in their 20s who are having one baby and even something, and are living in a city or even something as simple as like, they dress similar to me. Like suddenly I'm like, you know what, maybe I could do it. Because basically I've always been, even when I have wanted children, cause it's, it's always come, come in phases. Like, do I want kids? Do I not want kids? When I've always sort of, when I've been on like the mindset of, oh, I want children, it's always been, I only want one. Like, and whenever, it's so weird how controversial the topic of having one child is. Cause I saw a TikTok where someone was reading, I cannot remember for the life of me what it was, but they were reading like a like a feminist author's, uh, I think it might've been a book or an article um, about how, especially for women and mothers, having one child is actually very beneficial to them. And of course, it's sort of a very uh, heteronormative, uh, sort of straight couple nuclear family way to look at it. But a lot of the time for mothers, if they're the ones staying at home, which so often they are because of childcare costs, um, maternity versus paternity leave, stuff like that. Mothers are always gonna be, mothers not will always, but are very often the ones who stay at home and look after the kid. Um, and for women to have a better work-life balance, social life balance mixed in with a child is actually really beneficial for women's mental and physical health to just have one child and call it a day. And I totally understand people that want to have more than one kid, like all power to you, but it's just something I saw, oopsie, sorry, I hit my microphone. It's just something I saw on TikTok, which I thought was really interesting. And someone, um, spoke about it and said like, look, I thought I was gonna have more kids and I had one child and I never wanna do this again. They're like, I love my child. I wouldn't change it for the world, but this has been the hardest shit I've ever had to do. And I don't wanna do it again. And I totally understand that. And you'd be surprised the amount of people who get so up in arms in comment sections about women making a choice to only have one child. Because like, first of all, I and, I, and you can tell I immediately, because I see so many people get so aggy about only children. I, I'm already getting defensive about it and like explaining to you guys, guys, I'm not even pregnant. But, and here I am explaining my my child, my child plans to you. But like, I already get so defensive because the the way that people act on TikTok isn't normal. Like someone is saying, I only want one child because motherhood was one of the hardest things I've ever had to go through. And you're gonna leave a comment saying, yeah, well actually I couldn't live without my sibling. Okay, that's not her fucking problem. It really vexes me. Like it vexes me when I see shit like that. Like may maybe I read into it a little bit too much, but I think that's really fucking rude. Like I genuinely think it's so fucking rude to talk about like, oh, well, you know, I actually couldn't live without my four siblings. Okay, cool. Good for you. I don't fucking care. <laughs> but, um, sorry, I know that's really random, but yeah, no. So I think that's why maybe I've been having baby fever at the moment because I was like, 
well, I wouldn't have to move. I could stay in London and raise the baby and it would have a really good support system because Lem's mum is totally going to be totally like a hands-on grandparent. And because if I have the baby in like a few years time, I'll be the first person of my friends to have a baby, which means everyone will be really excited and want to look after it. Like it just seems so ideal. And I'd raise it where I, to be fair, I'd probably have to move flats because it's only one bed, but yeah, like it just, it just like, I'm like, wait, I can actually have a baby and keep my life completely normal. And also I saw Julia Fox talking about this. Love Julia Fox, by the way. So annoyed I forgot to put her in my It Girl video. See, I with my It Girl video, um, obviously I love everyone leaving comments, but like the comment section could be so infuriating because it's literally just people being like, what about this person? And it's like, guys, I can't put everyone in there. I'm sorry. But one person I was genuinely annoyed about leaving out was Julia Fox because I love Julia Fox. And she was saying it was something called like, oh, what was it called? But basically it was like, you don't have to play with your child to be a good mum. And basically I think it's like the Scandinavian way of raising your children. One of those like, you know, Scandinavia, Scandinavia, Netherlands, Denmark kind of countries. What is it like middle, the middle of Europe? I don't know, sorry guys. Um, I don't know that much about geography. But basically it was like, I think it's like the Scandinavian or like the Netherlands way of parenting where instead of like treating your child like, they are going to like break and that they can't do anything. You're meant to treat your child and sort of get them involved with things. And that can a lot of the time be more stimulating to them than playing, than you playing with them. Because I have a little sister. My little sister is, um, how old is she? She's five, she's five years old. I'm 24, my little sister's five. Um, And playing with her, like I love her, but playing with her is so boring. Like it's so boring, like, uh, I just don't like, and, and a lot of the time, and a lot of people feel the same way. A lot of people find playing with your children to be boring. And apparently like getting your child, getting your child involved with sort of things like doing like the, what, like the clothes wash, doing the washing up, cooking, gardening, that can actually be a lot more stimulating because it feels like a lot more rewarding and they feel like they're actually doing like grown up stuff rather than you going and playing with them and them knowing they're on a very limited time frame because you're gonna have to go and do something or you're gonna get bored, which is totally understandable because playing with children is so boring. And also like I've met like, like, you know, when you just meet nice children and you're like, oh, I don't dislike all children. I just dislike some children. (laughs) Do you know what I mean? But yeah, no, and I remember my friend Caro actually, um, who listens to the podcast, shout out Caro, um, messaged me because I put it on my close friend story, like, why do I want a baby so badly? And Caro messaged me like, oh, I think it's because of like me and Lem have moved in together. It's like the homemaking, you know, because now it's fully settled. Like I've got all my furniture, I've got all my decorations. There's nothing else to really do to the flat except for live in it. I feel like maybe my my ovaries are like, okay, it's time to put a baby in it. We gotta put a baby in this bitch, let's go. But um, no, I don't, I don't actually want a baby yet. And I feel like, oh God, I feel like I've like jinxed it. Like the podcast gods are gonna hear me and then real God is gonna hear me. And then I'm, I'm gonna end up with a baby. There's gonna be a stalk that's gonna drop me off a baby in my window. Oh my God, another weird memory that just popped into my head. By the way, I'm not religious. I feel like that movie sound really religious, I'm not. Um, I remember when I was watching Greece with, again, one of my dad's girlfriends. <laughs> Player. Um, one of my dad's girlfriends. And I wasn't really watching it properly. I was really, really young. I think I was like seven or eight years old. And it's when Rizzo thinks she's pregnant. And I asked, I can't remember, I can remember her name, but I don't want to say it. I asked my dad's girlfriend at the time, why does she think she's pregnant? And she said, oh, it's because she saw a stalk in her window. And I believed that until I rewatched the, until I rewatched Grease when I was like 15 years old. It's cause she missed her period. Thank God I never said any of this shit out loud. Cause I would have made, my made myself look so stupid. I would have made myself look so stupid. She was really religious too, actually. Um, and another thing sort of on the topic of kids, sorry if like this kid stuff is really boring you. I'm literally just talking about things which have been on my mind recently and having a baby has been like massively on my mind. Um, but no, I think I'm gonna wait at least two years, at least I think. And to be fair, in two years I could have changed my mind again. Like I'm so flip floppy with my, do I want a baby, do I not? I'll probably change my mind in two years, but I feel like two years seems like really ideal because 
I'm, oh God, I'm getting really sick of like hangovers and stuff. Like, <laughs> but also I want to make the most of like living in London. I at least want to wait two or three years because I realize I live in London, but I don't really do that much during the day. So I've started writing a list on my phone of things that I want to do in London. Um, anyways, so, but not so much I saw, which I thought was really interesting is like, if I was having baby fever, would I post the baby online? And I'm very like, uh, no, no. Like I'd probably tell the baby's name, but I don't think I would post any um, pictures of the baby online. I think I saw, I think it was um, Hannah Witten was talking about it on a video or a TikTok or something where apparently by the time a child is five, they have over 1,500 pictures of themselves posted on the internet. I'm not sure whether I, it could be 1500, it could be like 150, but I feel like it's veering onto more 1500 if it's five years. Or maybe it's 15,000, no, it's, I think it's 1500. Um, which is just insane to me. So I feel like I would do like no posting of the baby, but I saw really recently that, I saw a TikTok where someone said, like with the whole family vloggers thing, children of family vloggers are beginning to grow up. Like they're beginning to get older and older and older. And I reckon in about 10 years time, a lot of them are gonna be adults, move out and then sort of realize how much they were exploited by their own parents and how much of their childhood was posted without their consent onto the internet for millions of people to view. Um, and I saw someone say like, do you reckon children of family vloggers are gonna start suing their parents? Which will be such an interesting thing to do. And honestly, I think I think people will. I think people will, if people end up on really, really bad terms with their parents and are very, very upset and violated with how they were posted online, I definitely think that people are going to start suing their parents, like children of family vloggers. Um, so I asked you guys over on my Instagram what stuff you wanted me to talk about this week. Follow me on Instagram if you want to get involved in the next episode. It's at Jordan A. Teresa. Um, and easily the most requested thing for me to talk about was Matt Hancock going on I'm a Celeb. Now, if you're listening and you're not from the UK, you probably don't know anything about British politics because I remember, oh my God, I remember when I posted this tweet that was like, why do British people know so much about American politics? I doubt Brad from California knows who Keir Starmer is. And this one I used to be really, really active on my Instagram stories and stuff. And I used to post like Keir Starmer slander every single day because I'm such a Jeremy Corbyn stan, like through and through. Um, like it's like Jeremy Corbyn's my dad and Keir Starmer is my stepdad. But I love my stepdad in reality, but like just, it feels like that sort of dynamic. Like Keir Starmer is my mum's new boyfriend who I don't like. Um, and I posted this on my story and I had a bunch of Americans replying like, yeah, I don't, I don't know who Keir Starmer is. I even had someone reply saying they thought, they thought Keir Starmer was my friend and that I was just like, dogging them out on my stories every single day. Like it was like an inside joke. <laughs> Sorry, that is so fucking funny to me. That is so fucking funny to me. But um, yeah, no, so if you guys don't know who Matt Hancock is, he was the health secretary and he was health secretary during the pandemic. Obviously I know the pandemic is still ongoing, but um, he was the the health secretary during COVID lockdowns and Basically, to cut a very, very long story short, he caused a lot, and I'm talking like hundreds of thousands of avoidable COVID deaths by letting people go back into care homes without testing them. Um, care home outbreaks were especially bad because of Matt Hancock's um, like very lax laws. And then he also um, broke lockdown himself and had an affair and then the someone leaked the security footage and then it became this whole public scandal he didn't step down or anything he didn't lose his job or anything but basically he like left his wife and his the the woman who he had an affair with who he's now with is the what like the ex like that she was married to oliver bonus which is like such a random like f piece of knowledge um so recently he's just been on like an absolute like sympathy tour i think he's like releasing a book i think he's literally releasing a book called the pandemic diaries or something and it's like what are you doing Pan pandemic diaries you you had time to write a fucking diary during this shit like what like why are you of all people writing a pandemic diary are you writing a pandemic diary about how fucking terrible of a health secretary you were i fucking hope so 
So like a lot of people have been focusing on the fact that Matt Hancock is like an absolute disgrace. So yeah, basically Matt Hancock's been going on this whole like sympathy tour to promote his book and basically to become a reality star. And he went on I'm a Celeb without quitting his job as an MP, as a Tory politician. By the way, it's for the Conservative Party, um, which if you're American, is basically like the Republican Party of the UK. Um, To put it very, very simply. So he goes on I'm a Celeb and then he gets fired. He's lost the whip, all right? He's got, I think that's the wording. I've never said that before in my life. I hope I'm wording that right. He has been fired basically because they had no idea that he was going on. And he's just been on this whole sympathy tour, basically becoming a reality star. I think he's gonna be on the SAS, like celebrity SAS who dares wins, whatever the fuck it's called. Um, And I see like, people are focusing on the fact that it's absolutely disgraceful that he is allowed to rehabilitate his image in this way because people are fucking falling for it already. Like a lot of, I see a lot of people young and old saying that they feel really bad for him on I'm a Celebrity because he he went on I'm a Celebrity because I want to prove that politicians are people too. Like shut the fuck up. So to relate it to the COVID thing, obviously hundreds and thousands of people died. I have seen people online and I know people personally who had to say goodbye to their dying relatives over the phone because of his rules and he was there breaking them, you know? And it's absolutely disgusting that he's been allowed to rehabilitate his image in this way. And I think what pisses me off a lot is that people, sorry, I'll I'll circle back in just a second, but people focus a lot on, this doesn't piss me off by the way, I'm, something else pisses me off, which I'm gonna talk about in a second. Um, but people focus a lot on like his behavior during COVID. And I also think it's really important to focus on himself as a politician and the fact that he is a politician for the conservative party. I think that the drama of COVID, having three prime ministers in a year, was it three? Yeah, having three prime ministers in a year, Liz Truss tanking the pound, crashing the economy. I think all of this like real drama surrounding politics at the moment has completely distracted us from like the roots of the Tory party and like who these people are. And Matt Hancock is a bad person because he is part of the Tory party. I haven't researched into this, but I can probably bet my own fucking life on it. Tory party has a history of vote, basically keeping the poor people poor and the rich people rich. It is very much the top 1% that benefit from the Tory party. And then they create this illusion about the middle class, like Margaret Thatcher created the middle class to further separate working class and middle class people, even though Tories don't actually care about the middle class either. Um, But, sorry. So basically, the Tory party are horrible, horrible people. Um, Matt Hancock has absolutely voted against free school meals for school children um, whose parents can't afford to pay their school dinners. you know, more and more people every single day are living below the poverty line. Nurse, he's voted against nurses, nurses getting pay rises. I think they only got a 1% pay rise last year. And Matt Hancock probably blocked um, nurses from getting a pay rise any higher than that. N- nurses are having to use food banks. Nurses are having to eat their patients' leftovers because they cannot afford to eat. Um, the Tory party are responsible for austerity policies in this country, which are basically cutting benefits. Um, And there have been people who have died. Like this is a serious fucking issue. People have died because their benefits have been cut off. You know, there was like people die freezing to death, no food in their stomach because of these austerity policies because their benefits got cut off because they were deemed fit for work when they actually weren't, when a doctor said you can't go back to work, but they have a meeting with someone who they've never met before and they say, oh no, you are fit to go to work actually. It's shit like that. And you know, the Tory party is also responsible for Grenfell. Um, Again, if you're not from the UK and you don't know what Grenfell is, Grenfell was a high rise um, council block of flats. which was in the 
which is in the borough of Kensington and Chelsea, which is, I think, the richest borough in London. Um, and residents would often complain about it be about the council flats being an eyesore. So they covered it in cladding. And to save money on the cladding, they used very, very cheap, flammable cladding. Um, and one day, I think it was a washing machine or a fridge uh, caught fire and the whole building went up in flames. And I'm pretty sure hundreds of people died. I'm not sure on the exact amount of people that have died, but hundreds of people died that day. Um, it could officially, like the number could be a little bit less, but there were a lot of people probably living in the building that weren't registered um, to be living there who died. Um, the Windrush scandal, also part, also problem with the Tory party. You know, Tories are evil, horrible, bad fucking people. And I think what's frustrating is that, you know, when we see someone like Matt Hancock, who comes across as a very normal person on I'm a Celebrity, I'm not watching it, um, but he comes across as very normal. People are like, oh, well, maybe he's not that bad after all. And I think the problem is, is that people can try and blame politicians being stupid and making mistakes when these Tory politicians are privately educated. They went to some of the best universities in the world. And I think what's so frustrating is that he's going to get to go on this fucking rehabilitation tour and no one's going to confront him about the hundreds of thousands of people whose blood is on his fucking hands. No, because he comes across as like a normal, likable person. Oh, I actually feel really sorry for him. Well, I fucking don't. He chose his bed. He can fucking lie on it. He never cared about poor people. He never cared about people of colour. He never cared about poor people of colour. He never cared about trans people. He never cared about starving school children. He voted against fucking feeding starving school children over the fucking school holidays during COVID. This man doesn't give a fuck. This man doesn't fucking care. And he gets to reap all of the fucking benefits of going on a sympathy tour. It's a fucking joke. It's actually disgusting. And the thing is, is that, you know, this is not the first time I'm a celebrity have done like their little piece of Tory propaganda. They had Stanley Johnson on, they had Toff who became like fan favorites who are major fucking Tories. And like, basically what I'm trying to say is that we need to stop platforming. Like he even went on fucking Diary of a CEO. What is he a fucking CEO of, Stephen Bartlett? Please. Like, can we stop fucking platforming people, bad fucking people who are responsible for people's anguish, despair, pain, deaths? Like, can we fucking cut it out? Sorry, I didn't mean to get so heated, but this, it really, really annoys me. The fact that we are literally just seeing fucking Tory propaganda unfold in front of our eyes. Um... But you yeah, know, that's basically what I have to say about that is, you know, of course we need to focus on his behavior during COVID, but also let's just focus on his entire political track record. And the fact that he is a bad fucking person. He's a horrible person, an unforgivable, disgusting human being who only cares about the needs of himself and rich people and does not care that poor people die because they know, they know that people, and also they're responsible for energy bills going up and people not being able to afford to heat their homes. They know that people die because of austerity policies. They know that people are going to freeze to death because of the energy bills going up and the fact that they refuse to cap it. They just don't care. They just don't care. Um, so, sorry again, I know that got really reheated, but it's something which I'm very passionate about. Like it's something which I'm very, very passionate about. Um, so the next thing which some of you guys requested me to talk about was Billie Eilish and her new boyfriend. So if you don't know, Billie Eilish, the singer, is dating Jesse Rutherford from The Neighbourhood. And it's actually really weird to me when people say, can you talk about Billie Eilish's new boyfriend? Like, oh, you mean Jesse from The Neighbourhood? If you guys don't know, The Neighbourhood used to be one of my favourite bands and I saw them in concert when I was, f I didn't see them in concert. I saw them at a gig. Like it was small. It was before they got like really, really big. Um, and like, it was like during like their Sweater Weather, you know, that album, I can't remember what it's called. Um, and I saw them when I was 15, which is nearly 10 years ago now, which is like so depressing. Um, and yeah, so Jesse Rutherford is 31 and Billie Eilish is 20. And then for Halloween, they dressed as a baby and an old man. Oh! Oh, it's not good. It's not good. And also he's known her since she was 15. 
it's great. Oh, date someone your own age. Stop being a weirdo. And you know what really, you know what is very like telling about all of this is can we stop blaming young girls for their creepy old boyfriends? Like, I feel like Billie Eilish has been getting more shit for this than Jessie Rutherford when she shouldn't be getting shit for this at all. Like, she has an old creepy boyfriend. It's not her fault. Um, yeah, no, so that was just a very, very short, quick one. Um, the next thing I want to talk about, which is something, again, I find so interesting, is has anyone else been absolutely fucking harassed by Jack Will's adverts recently? I am obviously, I use TikTok. I use TikTok a lot. And there, every single advert has been a Jack Wills advert. And I find it really interesting because basically they've completely rebranded really, really recently. Um, so if you don't know, Jack Wills, basically their like previous branding was like British countryside, uh, sort of like luxury high street, university student, but like Cambridge, Oxford, I don't know, what other posh unis are there? What's the one that Jack went to? It begins with a D. I'm so sorry. Jack, Jack doesn't even listen to my podcast, but I literally can't remember what uni he went to. Sorry guys, my camera stopped recording. Basically it's like posh university student and they were huge. They were huge in, oh, I sound like Donald Trump there, gross. Um, they were absolutely huge in the 2010s. Like I could not even begin to describe, like I begged my dad for my 13th birthday to get me a Jack Wills gilet and he got it for me and it was amazing. Um, you yeah, know, they were really, really big. Like you can literally see pictures of when Harry, uh, not Harry Styles, when One Direction were on the X Factor wearing Jack Wills. Like it was absolutely huge. And basically um, it the brand fizzled out. They failed to get with the times and they nearly went under. I think they like went into administration and then a big um like sports giant sports direct bought bought them out of administration and has clearly been working on rebranding them and a very very important thing to note about um about jack wills is that they were very their branding back uh sort of like 10 was it 11 12 like 12 years ago was very exclusionary like it was rich white skinny like that's their kind of branding like posh like that was their kind of branding it was very very exclusionary it was basically like a cool kids club and obviously very uninclusive uninclusive very exclusive marketing it doesn't really run nowadays to be honest um so they had to rebrand and they've rebranded it's jack Wills is completely unrecognizable now it's like very cool very trendy um all their all their uh, models are very inclusive um and it's really really interesting to see um obviously it's a good thing that they are making an effort to be more inclusive um obviously when you sort of see a brand like jack wills who used to be very exclusive I don't know whether exclusive is like the right word because exclusive sounds like a good thing, but I mean exclusive in a bad way, like they're excluding people. Um, obviously a brand like Jack Wills that used to be purposefully not inclusive, now being inclusive, it makes you raise an eyebrow, like how genuine is this? Like it feels very disingenuous. Um, but also on the other hand, they have been bought out by completely different management. So I don't think the people who like, who like made Jack Wills so exclusionary in the first place are making any money from this because they they sold out, if that makes sense. Like they sold their their part of the company. Again, sorry if I'm making no sense. Um, but also I can completely understand why it feels like really, really disingenuous to people. But also like the new clothes, I don't know. I'm not really feeling them. Basically the new clothes, I'll see if I can insert some pictures for any of the people who are watching on YouTube. The new clothes are like, really really plain and like boring and they've played it extremely extremely safe obviously to try and make money but to me it looks like clothes generated by an ai like that's the only way i can describe it the new jack wills rebrand it looks like clothes that like you typed into ai like gen z tiktok clothes plain like, that's what it looks like to me. Like, if I'm being completely honest. 
Um, I don't know. It's like, it's not, it's not even like the clothes are dated. They just seem like a bit boring. Like I wouldn't be surprised if they went under again because there's absolutely nothing enticing or interesting about the rebrand. And I think some, a direction which they should have gone in. Basically what I think that they should have done is I think that they should have stuck to their old aesthetic, apologized for the fact that the previous branding was so exclusionary um apologize for that even if the people who were in charge of the brand being so exclusionary aren't working there anymore aren't making any money from it they should still apologize anyway and then i think that they should maybe make their branding more inclusive and then play into aesthetics of tiktok like you know dark academia and sort of that polo ralph lauren old money kind of like gossip girl aesthetic. I think they really, really could have played into that because I remember their old quality was really good. Like I I remember my gilet was really good quality. I actually, funnily enough, this was very unplanned. I bought a Jack Wills scarf off of Vinted. It was a, it's, it's navy blue with like pink speckles. You can't really tell it's Jack Wills at all. Right? I haven't bought a massive scarf that says Jack Wills on it. Um, for two pounds off Vinted. And I know it's going to be good quality. Like they, they, they used to do really, really good quality stuff. And I feel like if they played and if they apologized for their past behavior and then stuck with the aesthetic, but made their branding far more inclusive, I feel like it really, really, the rebrand could have really, really worked. I don't know. I'd love to know what you guys think. Um, and also, I think it's just, there's just been a massive influx in influencer marketing and it's just like annoying because a lot of the time I do not believe that these influencers are wearing these Jack Wills clothes because they're so boring. Um, even like, oh my gosh, like even like they released a lingerie collection. How did they manage to make lingerie boring? Their lingerie just looked like a extra boring version of lounge lingerie. And I own so much lounge stuff. I love uh, lounge uh, underwear. Um, I own loads of their stuff and they basically just made a boring version of lounge lingerie. They literally just made like Gen Z lingerie, like put into an AI, like that's how it feels. Um, what I'm going to finish this episode on is I'm going to talk about, <sighs> I don't want to talk about it. Savage X Fenty using Johnny Depp as a model in their newest runway show. <sighs> So, by the way, I am going to be talking about domestic violence and abuse. So if there's something which just triggers you, um, feel free to leave and I will see you guys at the next episode because I'm going to be talking about this until the end of the episode. Um, obviously, I'm like massively, massively disappointed. Um, like, I remember I was a bit speechless when I found out. Like, I couldn't believe it. Like, really? Um, I have been very vocal on my social medias about my support of Amber Heard. Um, and I know even saying it on this podcast, it's going to cause controversy. Um, but I remember when I first, so it was when it was all coming out, I didn't know anything about it. I just assumed that the relationship was mutually abusive, even though there's no such thing as mutual abuse. Um, I didn't know until after that, but basically I just assumed it was that and I didn't really look into it. And then the whole sort of campaign was rubbing me up the wrong way. And it just felt like disgustingly misogynistic and something just wasn't sitting right with my soul. So I decided to do a little bit of research. I basically just read like a whole timeline of abuse. And in my opinion, it seems that Johnny Depp had been abusing her for years. He was, I think 46 and she was 23. Um, He had been physically, emotionally abusing her. He even sexually abused her. Um, And then she just fought back. Um, And his PR team went into absolute overdrive trying to clean his image and trying to make out that she was the crazy person who was lying about it when she actually wasn't. Um, And even when I first started being quite vocal on my social medias about my support of Amber Heard, I received so much abuse because it was right in the middle of the trial and I was going to take a fucking stance. And luckily I received a lot of support as well of people being like, I knew that you would, um, you'd think there's something up with this. Like, thank you for being vocal for victims of abuse. Um, But yeah, no, so I, I still received a lot of abuse about it. I still received like a lot of really horrible, horrible DMs on my Instagram about it. Um, And basically now that the trial's over, 
it seems that a lot of people are swinging the other way. And obviously I understand that everyone's social media is an echo chamber of their own beliefs, but also like, you know, the I think it was like Pop Crave or someone announced it. The quote retweets and all of the replies were all very pro Amber Heard and people couldn't believe it. Like people were so disappointed and disgusted. And yeah, no, I, I, I again, I, I don't really think I have much to add apart from like, I am absolutely disgusted. I'm glad that people are beginning to, uh, are, are believing Amber. And if you are someone who is on the fence about it, I really recommend just reading into the case. Um, it's a point text, it's a textbook like definition of Davo, which is basically a technique where the, it's a very common technique used in court where the abuser paints the abused as the actual perpetrator of abuse, which is why a lot of his evidence got thrown out in UK courts because the UK judge recognized that he was using Davo. And that's why in the UK, you can legally call Johnny Depp a wife beater. Um, So yeah, no, this, I mean, I, I, I don't think I've ever really spoken about it because I was just so worried about the abuse that I was gonna get. and. I think every woman has felt really triggered by just the onslaught of misogyny um, just going on this year. Andrew Tate, Amber Heard. Um, and, you know, I think something which is really important to take away from this is that there is no such thing as a perfect victim. No such thing as a perfect victim because when someone fights back, they will be accused of being an abuser. And when someone doesn't fight back, people say, oh, why didn't she do anything? The only person that is a perfect victim is someone who is dead. And by then, it's too late. And I think it's absolutely disgusting that, again, I just repeat repeating the same thing, it's absolutely disgusting that, that Johnny Depp has been allowed to have a career, someone who is literally besties with a fucking accused rapist who collects Nazi memorabilia. Like, what? And also, I know this is slightly irrelevant, but I saw a tweet which says, it looks like he stinks of piss. And it's like, it's fucking true. He looks like he fucking reeks. Like, what the fuck? Um, and also someone said that he looks like the turf that BBC would bring on during a debate to provide balance, which <laughs> is really true. But basically, I will finish this podcast here. Um, but I do really hope that Amber Heard is is doing okay. I cannot even begin to fathom what she's been through to be ridiculed and bullied on such a wide scale. And I think what pisses me off quite a lot is I am totally open to people thinking that she was an abuser and then reading into it and changing their minds. You know, the PR, the PR, that was going on around that case was insane. Um, and you know, like guys, I used to be in 2016, I used to be like an anti SJW, anti feminist, like, you know, people change. But also one thing I will not stand for is people who have large platforms who ridiculed Amber Heard being abused, who ridiculed her being sexually assaulted are just, very, very quietly deleting and moving on. Like, if you are going to do that, if you are someone who ridiculed a victim of abuse, apologize. It's the right fucking thing to do, apologize. Because I cannot even begin to imagine what she went through. And even if you don't care about her, Think about anyone who, if you have a large platform, anyone who's a victim of abuse seeing that. It's awful. But um, yeah, no, I, I genuinely hope that Amber Heard is doing okay and that one day she can recover from this. But um, yeah, no, I'm going to go now and I will see you guys next week for a new episode. Bye.